Introducing Bruce is not an easy task for me. Um, standing here this evening, I'm beginning to understand how difficult it must be for Matt Leone to present his longtime friends uh, before an audience of people who know them and don't know them and maybe are meeting them for the first time. Reading off a list of awards and professional accomplishments seems too formal and dull, while at the same time sharing the anecdotes that explain the amount of affection that you hold for the person might be too difficult, too personal, and certainly too, too long. So aware of the shortcomings of both approaches, I'm going to try to sort of thread the needle uh, between um, a rock and a hard place uh, by doing a bit of both. I was first introduced to the poetry of Bruce Smith in 1999 in one of Matt Leone's classes here at Colgate. The poems were from his not yet published book, The Other Lover, a book which would later be selected as a finalist for both the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. I should mention that these medals um, for finalists, uh, Bruce sort of carelessly leaves tossed around his house on a windowsill or on a, <laughs> on a mantle. Um, so that when you go over to visit his house, you pick it up and you're like, oh, what's this thing sort of tossed here on the mantle? Oh, it's in a medal for a National Book Award. How about that? Um, which sort of shows the casual indifference which with, with which he receives these awards. After reading the poems in Matt Leone's class, I quickly decided that I was going to write like Bruce Smith one day. Matt Leone was happy to oblige my dream, and the next summer I had the opportunity to intern with Bruce here at the Writers' Conference. Um, and after the day's work was done and I'd done the photocopying for him and you know, collated all the entries, he would take us down to the Hourglass downtown, which hopefully we'll all get a chance to visit some point this week, and share stories of his work with prisoners and his stint teaching spoiled rich kids. And Justin isn't here, so I don't have to apologize for that. <laughs> he also listened intently as we, his students, talked of the characters, events, and locales that filled and fueled our writing. He gave his time generously and freely during breakfast, lunch, in the afternoons, in the evenings, to dis discuss craft with us who were eager to hear from him. Humility and generosity were the dominant impressions of Bruce I came away with after that first summer. In successive summers, he confirmed this initial impression, but these attributes became all the more impressive and improbable in a poet of such increasing accomplishments. His poems frequently appeared and continue to do so in the best literary journals, including Poetry, The Paris Review, Agni, The American Poetry Review, and are often selected for best American poetry like they were in 2003 and 2004. He received grants from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. And in 2003, he started teaching just an hour away at the MFA program in Syracuse University, a place which I quickly decided to follow him to. Bruce's generosity at Syracuse was recently honored through an award for excellent in excellence in graduate teaching, which he writes, I'm sec secretly proud of, although my colleagues think it's a diversion from research. While at Syracuse, I began to understand that Bruce's humility and generosity were based in another of his attributes, seen through his work, a restlessness bred from a quest for concise expansivity, if that makes sense. Though I don't think I realized it until just a few weeks ago rereading his work, Bruce's writing, <clears throat> what drew me to Bruce's writing in the first place was his ability to talk about family, the mechanics of car repair, globalization, social class, sex, death, ex-lovers, sports, religion, and Ovid in 25 lines or less. Half Whitman madly cataloging the broad and gritty world, and half Dickinson stitching songs of existential inquiry. Such work is never finished, which is why Bruce keeps getting better and better. His previous book, Songs for Two Voices, was a collection of integrated call and response sonnets, which opened up a compact, self-resolving poetic form to allow for counterpoint and ear resolution. In his newest works, a collection of poems called Devotions, because they all share that as the beginning of their title, Whitman has taken the reins. But though the outwardly formal poetic elements are less present, the tight musicality has not gone missing. It's simply sublimated. Lee Young Lee once claimed that when he sat down to write, he tried to use words that would flee the mind the moment they'd been read. 
Reading Bruce's devotions is similarly effortless. The lines do not call attention to their own musicality. But where Lee Young was aiming for some zen-like state of linguistic transcendence, Bruce's words are sleeper cells, wholly of this world, quietly smoldering with zeal, waiting for that moment, three lines down, half a page later, a day away, where they catch on another phrase or image or event and ignite, and your understanding of his poetry, poetry in general, yourself, is changed. Reading these new poems, I want more than ever to write like Bruce Smith, and with each successive book, Bruce makes that aspiration both more, more worthwhile and more impossible to achieve. May his poems tonight inspire us all towards relentless creativity and the humility that comes with the realization that every zenith is just the base camp for a new ascent. Ladies and gentlemen, Bruce Smith. And thanks to Matt. It's a minor art form, those introduction things, and uh, too, uh, too generous. And, um, and thanks to Lynn for coming, for helping me with the devotions. I really appreciate that. Professor Staley from Colgate. Um, so I'm going to read some of these new poems called Devotions, and um, I'll just do that. And then you can later, you can ask me stuff. Me porte como quien soy is a Lorca line, which means I behave like what I am. A legitimate, he said, un gitano legitimo, a, a legitimate gypsy. Um, and that's, a, that's I, I actually translate that line here. This is called Devotion, New York, 1970. In the singing school, there were weep holes and rats preternatural creatures in sequins who spoke a creole no one understood. There was a pain threshold feedback from the amps. There were harlequin opals in the navels. There were flames of cellophane. The exhaust fan flamed. I behaved like what I am, a legitimate gypsy, said Lorca's shadow leaving St. Mark's in the Bowery. In the work and underwork of the coat closet, you were rubbed in fur and worsted. There was a narcoleptic Juliet on a balcony, your voice annoyed. There was archaeology in the twice-cooked pork, cultures in the cheeses. Instead of character, you had disease. There was a mime of the Holocaust in your run for the bus. You went through tunnels saying, in a gata de vida, baby, and came out blinking like Play-Doh. The burden of autumn sun, sparrows, sophomores and young execs, arrogant, humble people who would whine and rant, and you, cynical and triumphantly getting by without soul, without dancing, without L-U-V. Um, this is for my class because we talked about flies today and I just happen to have a spare fly poem. <laughs> um, this is called Devotion Fly. A fly like an envoy for the lost boys or a delegate sent to dicker with the dead. Does it want in or out? Does it belong to the generations of generations or descend from one who grazed the face of Dickinson and whispered in her ear the middle octave key of F? Does it want nectar or the dead and which am I? Vectors for fugue and spontaneous bruising vectors for pestilence and gods who call for sacrifice. Shit seraph, heaven worm, world eye, scholar bent over the heated pages of the Coptic, translating the words matter and heaven in its three-week paradise. Fly worries everything. Fly walks on the ceiling. 
fly works its rosary, a discalced nun of doubt, our intercessionary, while we are free to be ever more certain about our God and the war. Fly buzzes in the blown open pages of the tiny novellas everyone carries, scattered like dreams in which we are all the characters. Fly already at it, its story a second-hand story, before smoke and a steel blue wash over everything. Looking up the way the Myrmidons looked up at the sun, skeptical, sweaty, while they killed the ram and you, strung the bow, lifted timbers. It was their job to fight for someone's love and rage, someone's beauty worth dying for. I, at this point, I walk to get my water. It's that <laughs> forgetting to do. Um, this is my elegy for James Brown called Crows. And when I read this the last time at, um, at Cornell, one of the ornithologists was telling me how, what a smart, which is kind of why I did this, called Crows. But it was, you know, what is, what, like crows use tools and crows have languages and crows built shart. I didn't know that. That was really, <laughs> that was really great. Crows. So, um, devotion crows. At the end of the song, a sadness, a sexual sadness, and you forgot you were in a song, as good songs make you do when they cover up your overheated body in a cape and you shrug it off and come back to sing again because you forgot the song doesn't end like you forgot the century goes on. Remember the barking dogs and ice flows and funny clothes of the Reconstruction and the centuries before, the ones with art and the middle passage, Holocaust and denial, talking in our cells of food we didn't get and the plantation of her skin where I was a slave trying to work for my freedom. I worked for a hundred years in the fields from can't see to can't see although it was only three winters measured in the gratuitous music of my twitching, sleepless love, and the murders of crows in the lower air of the city at dusk, like badly thrown, badly drawn stars, liquidating an existence. The crows speak of the rape, the tongue cut out, the children baked into a pie, with the one word they have, they speak of my love. They speak of James Brown with her one word, awe. The crows know what he meant when he went from 2-4 to 1-3 on the downbeat. The crows know odd and otherworldly. They know syncopation and change. They've been in the wind. They know the fame of the flames. The crows know South Carolina and Augusta, Georgia, the slave block and the cotton fields and cornfields unseeded by will and the scarecrows and the handguns. They've eaten fast food and they've eaten roadkill. They've been to the Apollo with their one syllable. They know the exigency and ecstasy and speak it. They tell of the breaking and entering and the shoe shine the scuffed surface buffed and rebuffed with a rag snap until it's a glossy blackness. From degrade comes jubilee, comes the glad things on one and three, the color of their wings. They have taken us to the bridge. They have used tools and none greater than the drum. By their one word, they have abducted us and sit in the crotch of the trees, rasping and jittering. Um, so this is um, the poet Busan has this haiku, which is um, it's simply moth sitting on the one-ton temple bell. 
and if I guess I have to explain it, I explain it away, but uh, like all haikus. So this is, this is um, called Devotion Whorelust, and whorelust is, is not what you think it is. It's, um, I'm looking, um, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm thinking of that Steve Martin routine where he, you know, said, what did you pay for your tickets in the first row? And then he gives everybody a massage, you know, because like, you know, he, hasn't, he hasn't done enough, uh, you know. Uh, this is uh, whorelust. Whorelust, roughly hearing passion, pleasure in sound, but also pain, as the child Tchaikovsky weeping in his bed screams, this music, it's here in my head, save me from it. His mother's voice will ring out like a rag. His father's chair squeals as he rises from his meal in E above C. Save me from the run of octaves in my skull, subtle as an owl's. Save me from the door slam and the plain song of the mosquito, the pandemonium of car alarms, the Donald Duck of the mall, and the twelve-tone row of the adored. It's here in my head, the tunings of the world sitar, the phrasings of the sax, the heave-yo-ho of stevedores, what Whitman had in his head with the blab of the pave and the voice of a streetcar conductor he loved. When it's quiet, but it's never quiet, I hear the hum or hiss, that mammal or reptile in the ark somewhere, and the caterwaul of the pulse and the god thud. It's in here. It's nowhere. When we wanted Manuel Noriega out of his asylum in the diplomatic mission of the Vatican, we played Van Halen's Panama. Panama, I, I should sing this at this point, but <laughs> this I can't. Um, Pa uh, Peter Leone will sing it later for you. <laughs> Panama -a, a until the Vatican complained. They have some mortally boring nerve. Listen, it's the clamor or the aura of the subdued you hear. A sob, a rasp, a drone. Sound the thrill, sound the tempered clavier. A voice makes a sound tearing the air, the veil rent, the entrails spilled. Cold is the sound you feel in your back teeth where they stuck the needle. Still you must listen for the racket of the cricket's front knees or the electric locks of the jail. Click in E above C. Still, but it's never still, you must pet the cat until the cat can't stand it. The feedback of nervous static and the self made by the loop of sensation becomes the poet praising a god aroused to anger by the ugly and put to sleep by the beauty of the mallet and anvil in the inner ear. There's a photo of Thelonious Monk under the lid of a piano at Minton's, New York, 1949, like a snapshot of whorelust. You can see he's making the sounds in his head come out all over the staves, offsetting the harmonies. He's leaning over the soundboard on top of the hammers. The smoke from his cigarette makes a long stem of a note, then something like a bass cleft. He smoked in quarter notes and rests, his stylish attack and swell, man, piano, smoke, like Busan's haiku of a moth on a one-ton temple bell. And um, I'm reading one more, and it's called Red Roof. Um, because I, I read somewhere that when you go and you stay at the Red Roof Inn, the most toxic things are uh, like the remote and the telephone. And so, so, um, but I just think, so, you know, like the remote being toxic and distance and uh, so um, devotion, red roof. And this is for the participants because it's about, it's sort of about writing too. 
It's about, you know, like that Elizabeth Bishop write it line at the end of one art. No, you don't. Everybody go in the back and stand there. Tomorrow in my craft talk, uh, Devotion Red Roof. Write like a lover. Write like you're leaving yourself for another. Write like you're de Beauvoir, object and subject. Write like you must rescue yourself from yourself. Become scrupulous to the body and the rain that floods you with rage and the crude sublimities. There was a lip print on the plastic glass wrapped in the mystic domestic interior of the room. Write like there's evidence, there's tenderness, like Paris were the scene of a crime. A lipstick by the bed, a phone number, a plastic glass with prints. The remote is toxic. At the Red Roof Inn, they couldn't recommend an alternative to suffering. Like lovers, we spoke of short-term, long-term knowledge, and the rest in the circle of hell the telephone allows. I want my piracy, I thought you said. The, f <laughs> the familiar doesn't travel well. The soul doesn't travel well. Poetry spoils. Write like your mingus. Write like the evidence vanishes. Inflammable walls between devoted ghosts. Smoke and the convention of the fourth wall pulled down. Drama majors, drum majors next door. The all-night opera with starling sounds. The red roof in hath me in thrall. The highway sounds like the sea in storm. Pirates with their perishable cargoes. Their ship goes down. The soul doesn't travel well. Write like the ship goes down with your belongings. Write like you're in thrall. We're blown, or blown around like Paolo and Francesca. Lovers, carnal, windy starlings, misled by the sublime, the binge and purge of the book and the body. I'm wildly attracted to you winter and fall when I fly the migration routes from Corpus Christi to St. Paul. Or is that summer? I do not travel well. I travel like a lover, boy king, or saboteur, stormed by the fluids of the body. I'm wildly attracted to your feathers, your lip and book. My greatest vows are in the getting out. I kneel to look under the bed for belongings. belongings. I've pirated myself. Thank you for the chance to fly, the leaving. Thank you for the soft pink tissue, your cargo of ghosts. The telephone is toxic. The body's a rumor. The leaf blower in the opera is over the top. Thank you for the brimming. Thanks for the speech acts and action, the alternative to suffering. Sorry for the hoarse sobs. I'm wild about the red noise of the traffic, the holy wars of the starlings. Flying back, all the songs are of glistening. Flying back, the passenger in 5D is unwilling to rescue others, unwilling to rescue himself. Write like you've lost your belongings. Thanks a lot. Uh. Born and raised in upstate New York, John Clinch has been an English teacher, a metal worker, a folk singer, an illustrator, a typeface designer, a house painter, a copywriter, and an advertising executive. After graduating from Syracuse University, he taught American literature and advanced composition to high school students. Three years and a Pennsylvania Teacher of the Year Award later, he set aside teaching and took up advertising. His career took him from one agency to the next until he found himself creative director of a high-profile Philadelphia shop, at which point he abandoned big agencies and founded a small one instead with his wife, Wendy. Since the publication of Finn, John has taught in Syracuse University's Project Advance program, addressed the National Council of Teachers of English, lectured at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut, and spoken before audiences at the American Library Association, Boston University, 
Penn State University, and elsewhere. His short stories have appeared in the literary magazine Manuscripts, where they were selected by the novelist John Gardner. Gardner, you might know, is the author of Grendel and his retelling of, of Beowulf, which was one of the things that gave John the idea he had for the novel I'll tell you about in a second. Of course, uh, Gardner retells Beowulf from the monster's point of view, um, and what John has done in Finn is retell in some ways uh, Huckleberry Finn's story, but it's not Huck Finn's story anymore, it's his father's story. And in that novel, he reveals the events that shaped the life of the man whom Jim discovers dead on the steamboat in Chapter 9 of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. In fact, Clinch carefully weaves the events in Twain's novel um, into his own novel very carefully. As he put it in a note at the end of his own novel, I have assumed that the Huck of Huckleberry Finn may not be an entirely reliable narrator. What boy is? What boy aiming to describe his relationship with a father as appalling as Finn possibly could be? Thus certain encounters with his father take on different nuances here than they possessed in Twain's novel. Throughout I have followed such narrative threads as the elder Finn and his particular brands of selfishness and bigotry have suggested to me dealing with the facts of Huckleberry Finn, Twain's novel, at least as fairly as Twain himself treated his own sources. For after all, as Ron Powers noted in Mark Twain, A Life, the author, quote, took a Democrat's view of fact and fiction. He privileged neither above the other and let them mingle in his work without prejudice, unquote. In a starred review, Kirkus Reviews described Clinch's novel Finn in glowing terms. A memorable debut, likely to make waves. A few incidents duplicate those in Twain, but the novels could not be more different. Instead of Huck's unlettered child's voice, we have an omniscient narrator, grave, erudite, and rich in the secretions of adult knowledge. Terse dialogue acts as an effective counterpoint. All along, Clinch's intent is to probe the nature of evil. The New Yorker called the novel harrowing and remarked, Clinch conjures the world of pre-Civil War America in all the complexity of its contradictions. While the book's females are somewhat sketchily drawn, he successfully sustains interest in a protagonist whose psychology is opaque to himself and of whom it is said, the only way you'll ever improve him is with a pistol. <laughs> Next week, the American Library Association will announce it has selected Finn as a notable book for 2008. Please welcome John Clinch. If you've been watching the news lately and paying attention to what's been going on in the Mississippi Valley, you will recognize why an upstate New York child such as myself was so shocked when he read, when I read, the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn for the first time. I was 10 or 12 years old, and uh, here I was adventuring down the Mississippi with this, with this child who meant nothing to the adult world. It seemed to me like the most surreal and strange and horrifying book I'd ever read. Um, I never read Tom Sawyer. In fact, I didn't read Tom Sawyer until I got around to writing this book, but I think I stuck with Huck because it had a reputation for being more grown up and more difficult. Uh, but I remember being terrified by it. I remember also being terrified by that body that comes floating down the river in that floating house. Now, picture upstate New York, picture here, picture the Erie Canal. I mean, that's as big a body of moving water as you have where I grow up. And Mark Twain presents me with the Mississippi River, big enough, swollen enough to support a house coming down. And in that house, a dead man on the second story. Huck and Jim go in chapter nine and they find famously a dead man with a bullet in his back lying naked in a bed. Horrifying enough, terrifying enough for me as a child, terrifying enough and interesting enough to me as an adult when I came back to it and realized that throughout that room was the wildest collection of stuff Mark Twain had left in the room with 
Pat Finn, it turns out, of course, although Huck doesn't know it's his father at that point in the novel, you probably remember. Huck, uh, Mark Twain had left there in that room just an incredible collection of things. The walls were marked all over with, uh, with, with markings made in charcoal, words and pictures. Huck called them the ignorant sort of words and pictures made in charcoal. Who knows what Huckleberry Finn, ignorant himself, must have meant by that phrase, the ignorant sort of words and pictures. There were men's and women's clothing on the walls. There were men's and women's underclothing hanging on pegs on the walls. There was a, a child's speckled straw hat. There were whiskey bottles. Whiskey bottles made sense, of course, because Pat Finn, as you recall, was sort of our great national alcoholic. Uh, there was a baby bottle. Now, that doesn't make the same kind of sense that a whiskey bottle makes. There were two black masks made out of cloth. Now, that suggests uh, criminality, if anything suggests criminality. Uh, there were all kinds of interesting objects, and it occurred to me, coming back to that scene as an adult, that if I intended to honor Mark Twain as a writer, I had to honor his choice of those things. And I had to believe that there was some reason for them. And therefore, it might be possible, uh, in, the, in the phrase of uh, Italo Calvino, to use them as a machine for telling a story. To take all those objects, the black cloth masks and the, uh, and the shotgun and the broken wooden leg and all those things and set them along the Mississippi and use them to generate the story of, uh, well, really two stories. One, how Finn came to be dead in that room, in that situation. And two, how Finn came to be the, the strange, sad monster that he is in Huckleberry Finn. And now you remember that he was, uh, as I said, an alcoholic. He was a child abuser of a very high order, and he was really the voice of racism in that novel. Um, those were all three things, once again, that I didn't manage to get at home, child abuse, alcoholism, and racism. So uh, once again, Finn was my introduction to those terrible, dark things, and I carried him in my heart for a long time. In order to write my own book and step away from Mark Twain, at least step beneath Mark Twain, I hope, uh, I needed to begin with a different body that comes floating down the Mississippi River under a low sun, pursued by fish and mounted by crows and veiled in a loud, languid swarm of bluebottle flies. The body comes down the river like a deadfall, stripped clean. It proceeds, as do all things moving down the Mississippi in the late summer of the year, at a stately pace, as if its blind eyes were busy taking in the blue sky piled dreamily deep with cloud. There will be thunder by supper time and rain to last the whole night long, but just now the early day is brilliant and entirely without flaw. How long the body has been floating would be a mystery if any individual had yet taken note of its passage and mused so upon it. But thus far, under that sky of blue and white, and upon this gentle muddy bed a swarm with a school of sunfish and one or two smallmouth bass darting warily as thieves, it has passed only empty fields and stands of willow and thick, brushy embankments uninhabited. A crow screams and flaps off bearing an eye as brown and deep as the Mississippi herself. Sunday morning, early, and the river is without traffic. An alligator gar, eight feet if it's an inch, rises death-like from the bottom and fastens its long jaw upon a hip bone which snaps like rotten wood and comes away. The body entire goes under a time or two, bobbing and turning, the eggs of blowflies scattering into the water like thrown rice. The urgent sunfish eddy. The blue bottles hover endlessly patient, and when the body has resumed its equilibrium and resumed its downward course, they settle once more. Boys note its passage first, boys from the village taking the long way to Sunday school, and their witness is as much nature's way as is the slow dissolution of the floating body into the stratified media of air and water. The corpse is not too very far from shore, and clearly neither dog, nor deer, nor anything but man. I'll bet it's old Finn, says one of them, Joe or Tom or Bill or perhaps some other. On this Sunday morning, down by the river bank, they are as alike as polished stones. My pap says they'll fish him from the river one day, for sure. Go on, says another. Yes, sir, worthless old drunk like that. Go on, says the other again. He picks up a flat stone 
and tests it in his hand, eyeing the crow, which has returned and sunken its beak into a pocket of flesh. Shows how much you know, that ain't even a man. I reckon you think it's a mule. It's a woman, no question, and a lot of them go jostling together and squinting into the sunrise and blinking against the glare on the water as if the only thing superior to the floating corpse of a man would be the floating corpse of a woman, as if seeking in unison for a lesson in anatomy, and never mind the cost. Finally, from one of them or another, but in the end from the childish heart in each save the learned one, this confession. How can you tell? Men float face down, anybody knows that, skipping the stone across the water to flush the crow, ruining his good trousers with the offhand brush of muddy fingers. They draw straws, and as the unlucky boy lights out toward the village, they enlist an adult and locate a skiff and cast off and make for the body. They hook her with a willow switch, these boys inured to dead things, and they drag her like bait to shore. One of them has been keeping a dead cat on a string for a week now. Just a kitten, really, a poor, stiff, dried husk, one exactly this way, string and all, in a game of mumbledy peg. The corpse floats low in the water, bottoming out in the mud that sucks at heel and buttock and drooping wrist. During its journey down the river, it has failed to swell in the common way of corpses left in the sun. It lacks for skin, all of it, from scalp to sole. Nothing remains but sinew and bone and scraps of succulent yellow fat that the crows have not yet torn free. One boy panics and loses his balance and falls into the water, his clothes spoiled for Sunday. Well, Finn has a lot to do with that body that's coming down the river at the opening of this novel. He has a lot to do with its poor, unfortunate, flayed state, and he has his reasons as they all have reasons, these characters like Finn, as they make their way through their lives. Finn is a man of the river, he's a man of the woods, he's a man who passes on those things, of course, to his son Huck as the best things he has to give him. Um, he's also, as we said, an alcoholic, and he lives the life of an addict in many ways. Uh, it's kind of a circular life. He goes around and around, does the same things again and again, acquires fish, acquires alcohol, acquires fish, acquires alcohol. Every now and then, the cycle is interrupted, and every now and then he's unable to run his trot lines and catch his fish and bring them up into the village to sell. And uh, that means he can't get alcohol, and that means that uh, the cycle is not going well for our friend Finn. And this one particular evening, the evening has gone cool, and the sharpness in the air suggests that by and by his water barrel will resume crusting itself over with the thinnest frangible film of overnight ice. Everything changes, he thinks. The woman is gone, and the world turns. He troops down the steps with his head, aching for whiskey, and his boot heel, the one into which he's driven a cross of nails to keep away the devil, leaving its own highly particularized trail in the dirt. He frees the skiff, and it finds its own way into the current, reliable and wise as a bloodhound. Many's the time it's taken him well past home on a night like this. Perhaps the skiff knew best after all. Perhaps he should have lingered down where it willed him, permitted himself to drift deeper and deeper into the slave states. Everything might have gone differently. This evening, though, he's wide awake and fully alert, perhaps more so than is entirely healthy for a man of his habits and inclinations. He sniffs the air, listens to the lapping of water and the creaking of oars from downstream and the clinking together of glasses from up on Dixon's porch and other sounds, too, from various other locations along the river, sounds of argument and talk and singing and work, always work, for it seems to him that someone is forever chopping wood or wielding a saw or dragging some heavy object somewhere along the amplifying reach of the water, even at the deepest hour of the night. He comes abreast of his most upstream trot line and pictures its swarming, struggling catch. Tomorrow he'll run them all and gut the slick fish clean and cash them one after another in a bed of wet reeds like Moses and the bulrushes, and then he'll bring them up into the village to sell. Thus, tomorrow night will not be like this night in the least, for he will be flush and able to do as he pleases. 
A flicker of light in the woods catches his eye and he considers pulling ashore for a while, following a certain path well known to him, and hitting up old Bliss, the bootlegger, for a drink or two on account. An idea that sparks up in his mind and dressed and distracts his attention just long enough that as he's considering the torturous walk into the deep woods to where the old man keeps his works, his drifting boat bumps against another, this one not moving with the current, but rather holding steady against it. Hey, watch where you're going. The voice of a boy, no older than Finn's own son, which gives him an instant's pause. You boys. A powerful scent of fish above the omnipresent smells of the night and the river helps Finn realize just where he is and why the boy's doubtlessly purloined skiff is hanging steady in the water here of all places and exactly what the young miscreants are up to under this blanket of darkness. Them's my trot lines, he says in a level voice. Shit fire, says one of the boys, and he goes plunging overboard rather than confront Finn's well-known wrath. Everything is wet. Fish arching in the bottom of the stolen skiff, the air erupting as two more boys jump to evade capture, Finn himself as he catches hold of a, a water-soaked and half-rotted paintless gunnel and makes fast. Only one boy remains, the youngest of the four, and the most innocent and the least equipped to be out on the river in this kind of a fix. A black child, barely visible in the stern, until the moon breaks through overhead cloud and reveals him there. He has a tear in his glistening eye and a hook in his palm that he's been trying to nurse out with no success. You boy. It weren't my idea, sir. Fussing with the hook as if it possesses mystical qualities. Is that a fact? Yes, sir. Why don't you go over with them others? It weren't my idea. Now, anyone could see that this one has been a good boy all his short life, and that the act of throwing himself on adult authority comes as naturally to him as breathing. Upon this one occasion, however, the truth serves him exactly as well as it has served 10,000 men who have come before Finn's father, the judge, in his time, which is to say, poorly. He offers up that palm with the hook in it, a bead of blood gleaming there by moonlight as if this explains everything, as if he has already endured all the punishment that he deserves. Aw, says Finn, and without a second look he grabs the line that leads from it to draw the child within striking range. He has acquired a natural caution about such thing from his years on the river, an instinctual feel for the tension of the line and the power of the hook and the secret breaking point of the tender pad of flesh within which the barbed iron has buried itself. The boy rises like a perch fighting his natural inclination to resist capture, judging furiously the relative risks and advantages of the two paths open to him. And before he can make up his mind to come along or jump, Finn is upon him with the back of his brutal right hand. A spattering of the boy's teeth precedes him into the river and the hook flies free, nearly but not quite catching Finn in the cheek. There's a spot of blood on the gunnel where the boy's head hit after the blow. And whether or not there's any thrashing to be heard from the river is no concern of Finn's, certainly not as regards a thieving black boy and a sissy at that, blubbering away about a hook in his goddamn hand. He kneels and bends to take up the gasping fish, tenderly as a shepherd. The question that uh, no one really asks about Huckleberry Finn is what sort of a woman would have a relationship with that character? Who would be Huckleberry Finn's mother? The answer that, uh, that I propose in this, uh, in this book is a black woman, a woman with, uh, with no choice in life, a woman not operating under a full set of freedoms, and uh, a woman who finds herself held captive against her will, of course. Um, one last small bit here, uh, which is uh, sort of a, m my homage to, uh, well, a couple of things. One is my, my long history in advertising. My long history in advertising has taught me that the, uh, the larger the type size, the easier it is to miss a mistake. Um, you know, so that's why when you see something on a billboard, uh, sometimes the uh, 800 number is wrong. Um, I learned that, and uh, I've also learned that uh, 
perhaps Mark Twain left us some clues in his novel Huckleberry Finn that uh, were so obvious, so big, so much a part of our culture now that we don't even notice them anymore. And the boy emerges squalling from his mother's womb, as do all children, regardless of parentage, dark with contorted rage and the bare, willful containment of his own pulsing, lively fluids, a drip with blood like some wrathful demon plucked from hell. His mother gives him his name, perhaps in anticipation of a dusky quality of skin that to his good fortune never quite returns after the first fading bluish-purple blush of his entry into this world. Huckleberry. It is a poor name for a boy, but she is poor in judgment, hardly past childhood herself, and the father is more interested in celebrating the boy's pale skin than in helping her choose. It is a name doomed to suggest not only the boy's curse, but the raw, pure accident of his creation and the unstraightened path down which he must tread. It is a name that bespeaks the simplest and most natural of freedoms given at birth to a boy whose accursed birthright may prove to admit none. Thank you. I wish I could, uh, the smoothness of that presentation, that's another thing to aspire to right there. Um, well, Kelly Cherry has been a longtime friend of this conference and a faculty member here for many years. Um, and we're happy to have her back after a far too long hiatus. Um, what I remember best about Kelly, besides her kindness and her wonderful writing and her great craft talks um, are uh, the ex is the excellent advice that she gives about the craft of writing. This morning in her tribute to George Garrett, Kelly was also teaching us about what it means to be a writer, how one negotiates the space between writing as an art and writing as a trade, and how one resolves the push for easy answers and quick conclusions with, as she said, the Janus faced nature of truth. When I worked as Kelly's intern at this conference back in 2002, I think it was, her very memorable advice to me was, learn to breathe on your own time. This is wisdom from an established writer that to a young and harried intern sounded like gold. It was a cherished talisman the secret that would unlock the greatness, capital G, within me, if only I could comprehend it and then enact it. In many ways, I'm still trying to enact it. Looking at Kelly's bibliography, however, one is tempted to accuse her of not taking her own advice. Kelly has published 11 works of poetry, the most recent of which is um, Hazard and Prospect, um, eight works of fiction, five of nonfiction, and two dramatic translations. Just last night, she told me that she has 15 more books in various states of outlining, brainstorming, um, that still need to be written. And she hits on new ideas regularly. Her exploration of multiple genres must certainly be due to the influence of Garrett on her own work. What she failed to mention, however, is that she also inspired him and his other students providing the beginning image for a collection of writing by his students and associates entitled The Girl in the Black Raincoat. When she's not playing the muse to young literary men, winning Pushcarts or O. Henry's, or being honored in Best American Fiction, Kelly is wrestling with her own multiple muses. She is equally successful in each of the genres her muses push her towards, which is a testament not only to the quality of her sources of inspiration, but also her ability to give herself over to them in whatever shape they may demand to be expressed. This morning at the craft talk, I asked a question about negative capability, which is, according to Keats, the capacity to, quote, remain in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason, unquote. Depending on how you parse this, it could be an expression of the pinnacle of intelligence, the mind realizing that though one is grasping the elephant's tail, to borrow from an image from last night, which feels like a rope, it may not be a rope, or that calling it rope is suitable for you at that particular time, in that particular place, but it may not be the best or only way of understanding what you're holding. 
But negative capability could also be, and this is how I've tended to parse it, a description of the goal of giving oneself over fully to the muse. That one's own intentionality is entirely subsumed by the work. The enactment of the dictum, a poem should not mean but be. In this sense, it is often understood to mean that the author must get out of the way of the writing itself. As Kelly writes in her essays, Why I Don't Keep a Diary and Why I'm Writing Stories About a Woman Named Nina, negative capability urges the author towards the margin and then off the margin entirely. The character subject image takes center stage. The author should be incidental, even absent. But of course the author cannot be absent. Garrett challenged such a notion by making himself a character of his own book. Kelly responds in her own right by positing the notion of positive capability. That is, the willingness to use one's own life experiences in one's own work. This is not to say one must aspire to autobiography, for as she said this morning, anything processed by memory is fiction. Fact is important, but it's the contingent fact, the for right now fact, the as I currently see it fact, the fact of the elephant tail which is, after all, the stuff that our lives are made of. What positive capability calls for, then, is not a definitive and often repeated answer, but rather the evolution of partial answers to recurring questions framed by the boundaries of what can and cannot be a possible answer. It's these boundaries, I think, that trace the shape of an author and the evolution of possible answers which breathes life into that shape. Kelly's own work embodies positive capability, using the stuff of her own life, not shying away from personal experiences and emotions, from love and loss, from memory and regret, while at the same time not grasping for easy answers. Reading her work is like dangling one's feet in a stream on a hot day, the water pulling at you to jump in. Tonight, we'll hear a small snippet of the evolution of an author as she gives herself over to these great questions. And just think, we have 15 more possible answers to go. Kelly Cherry. Am I properly plugged into everything? Okay. Can you hear me back there? Okay. Um, after that wonderful introduction, I'm really tempted to ask Matt if I can sign him up to be my official biographer <laughs> for the future. Um, it is an incredible honor to follow two writers of such terrific power. I thought Bruce and John were absolutely amazing. Um, and I want to clap again. I want to clap again. <laughs> um, I'm afraid the story I'm reading tonight I have picked on the basis of, act, of, of exactly one criterion, which is that it is short enough. My new stories tend to run 25 to 35 pages. And that's, that's too long for a reading. So I've picked the shortest of the new stories. It's titled, Her Life to Come. She is 17, a fresh woman, as she calls herself. She is African, Italian, Cuban, Native American. The native part is Ojibwe. She wears an earring in her eyebrow. Like many 17-year-old girls, she plans to be a psychology major. Her own psyche fascinates her, fascinates her the more she becomes aware of it, and she feels that this gives her an understanding of psychology from which others could benefit. If she doesn't become a psychologist, she might decide to be a modern dancer. Both the mind and the body interest her, especially her mind and her body. <laughs> she loves the university, its buildings with crenellated tops, the huge live oaks, some with Spanish moss, some with ferns clinging to their limbs, and the football weekends when the Seminoles play at home. 
in her dormitory room in Tallahassee with its very cool collector item posters of Stokely Carmichael and Lucille Ball. She records her thoughts and feelings in the journal that, her, that was her going away present when her parents left her here at the start of the school year. She tries on different handwritings like jeans, wondering which suits her best. Some of her friends keep diaries on the internet, uh, but she prefers to make her entries in bed just before she turns out the light. At the moment, she is experimenting with different ways of writing her name. Ramona Maria Prairie Moonlight Iglesias, she writes, <laughs> with her pink ink felt pen on the inside cover. Today is a holiday, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Spring semester classes don't start until tomorrow. Her roommate has gone off to swim in somebody's pool. You should come with us, she said, as she gathered her swimsuit and sunblock. But Ramona preferred the cool of their air-conditioned room. It is hot, a hot day in January. All over town, the palmettos, the poinsettias in big pots, look as if they'd burn your fingertips if you touch them. In the next moment, Ramona's telephone is going to ring. She doesn't know this, but it will, and she will pick up the receiver. It will be her mother who will tell her she has to come home because Ramona's father has killed himself. He has hanged himself in the bathroom. Ramona loves college. She loves how her mind is filling with ideas and facts, up to the brim. Every day she wakes up eager to learn something else. She can't wait to start on courses in her major and just last night was reading the text for Advanced Deviant Psychology, <laughs> although majors don't get to that class until senior year. She has not yet answered the telephone, but when she hears the word bathroom, she will, even while feeling guilty about it, wonder why her father chose the bathroom and if he really did choose it or if his death was a sexual accident like the ones in the chapter titled Autoeroticism. But as soon as the shock fades and she begins to cry, she'll forget her first shameful thought and remember that her father was forced into early retirement last year, that he is was melancholy by nature, he said it was the Ojibwe in him, and that her mother and father had not been getting along. They had vicious, screaming arguments, each calling the other worse names than they had been called. Ramona will find herself throwing clothes into her backpack and sobbing at the same time, grabbing her sunglasses as she flees the room, the pack over her shoulder, heading for the bus station. She will never see her dorm room or her roommate again. At 23, Ramona will work behind the counter in a copy shop. She wears high catch-me heels and eyeliner and that earring in her eyebrow. She has smooth skin, a light bisque shade, and the irises of her eyes are almost as dark as the pupils, which makes them look as large as almonds. She can be pensive. Sometimes her friends say to one another, Ramona has a secret, but they never ask her what it is. When her friends ask her about her ethnic heritage, she explains that she is African, Italian, Cuban, and Indian. She says it is the Ojibwe that gives her trouble. My father's father came from Minnesota to work in an orange grove, she tells them, but he missed the thousand lakes, the state bird, the snow drifting silently between hemlock and spruce. Ask me what is the state bird of Minnesota. What is the state bird of Minnesota, they ask. The mosquito, she answers. <laughs> they groan and roll their eyes, but she continues. He was homesick, so he put up a teepee in the backyard. He left his wife and children, including my father, in the house and moved into the teepee. Night after night, his wife waited for him to come in. When she could no longer keep her eyes open, and only then, she turned off the light and went to sleep. My grandfather lay in his teepee, looking at the sky through the hole in the top. If he squinted, he said, he could make the moonlight look like prairie moonlight along the Iowa border. So my father named me Prairie Moonlight. 
But your name is Ramona, her friends protested. Ramona Maria. That's true, she said, and it is also prairie moonlight. She will marry within the year. A budding lawyer comes into the shop wanting to make a lot of copies that no one in his office will see, and she shows him how to use the machine with the collator and automatic stapler. He is lean with a sharp-edged, sexy face, the kind of face that can cut a woman's heart to shreds, but he wants her. He wants her every which way and everywhere. They will marry at his folks' place in Miami. At the wedding, her mother cries. Her mother is wearing a beige suit that shows off her young-looking skin and navy blue shoes. Ramona Maria puts an arm around her mother's shoulders and coaxes a smile onto her face. Reggae and salsa blast into the summer night. A film of sweat covers bride and groom like saran wrap. The groom kisses his bride on the top rim of an ear. She flashes her eyes at him, rolls her hips when she walks in front of him. The party goes on until daybreak, but she and her groom leave at one in the morning, the stars still bright above the Atlantic. The wind is rising, and the hairs on her arms stiffen in response. Dave slogs away in a firm where most of the cases are divorce cases. Sometimes there are personal injury lawsuits to file. That's about it. Ramona Maria will feel sorry for her husband and try hard to bring some fun into their life together, but she does not get pregnant in spite of their efforts. She will visit her doctor, let him do an endometrial eye biopsy, and start her on fertility drugs. She will make Dave leave work to come to the doctor's office with her. They will circle dates on the calendar tacked to the inside of the door of the bedroom closet. When they have sex, it will be half-heartedly, because they are afraid to risk more disappointment. Finally, Ramona Maria will discover that she is pregnant, but before she can call her mother to tell her the news, she cramps and bleeds. Dave will find her lying in bed when he comes home at 6.30 in the evening. He will stretch out beside her, except that he is in his suit and on top of the sheet while she is under it and in her nightgown. He will listen while she tells him what has happened. He will sit up then, stack the pillows behind him, and pull her head onto his lap. He will whisper comforting words to her, as if she were the lost baby and not the would-be mother. Strands of her long hair, which has a satiny Native American feel to it, along with a tendency toward wayward Italian waves, stick to her face, which is wet with tears, and he will pry the stray strands away one by one. She will look up at him and see the underside of his clenched chin, the bones in their wedge of skin. The next time she miscarries, she does not tell him. She does not want to upset him. They live in a ranch house in a subdivision where all the houses are ranch houses. Blinds and curtains are drawn against the relentless sunshine. Water bugs struggle out of the bathtub drain. Outdoors, slender lizards drape themselves over rocks as if they were at a Roman banquet. Small striped scorpions keep an eye on things from pockets of darkness between porch steps, under the house, beneath bushes. At midday, the neighborhood is silent, and yet the sky seems like an invisible wire twanging a high note, and she can't get it out of her head. She counts her blessings. He doesn't beat her, doesn't lord it over her. He still makes love to her, but he stays late at the office. Eventually, they will talk it over, and he will move out. Where will you go, she'll ask, and be surprised when he says, I've been seeing somebody. We've decided that I'll move in with her. <clears throat> For a moment, she will not be able to breathe. Two weeks after he leaves, she will discover that she is pregnant. She is 29 when she becomes a mother, and she will have twins because of the fertility drugs. Dave will come to the hospital when she goes into labor, but after the twins, a boy and a girl, are born, he will go home to his girlfriend, also a lawyer. Her mother will help with the kids, at least until Ramona, Ramona <clears throat> Maria can get on her feet and on a schedule. 
At 35, she will work at a juice stand at Disney World in Orlando. The twins are in school. She applied for a job as Minnie Mouse, but it went to a college kid looking for summer work. She will go back to college herself. She can take a class now and then, she will realize, and sooner or later it will add up. Instead of studying psychology, she will enroll in information technology. She will be an it girl. In her class on information systems, she will meet a compactly built former high school basketball coach with skin as black as a moonless, starless night. He is 38 and has a 13-year-old daughter from a former marriage. Her name is Athalia from the Bible. Perhaps Ike and Athalia's mother had not actually read the Bible, or they would have found another name. The biblical Athalia was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, and she arranged for the murder of all the male children in the royal family. On weekends, Ramona, Ike, the non-biblical Athalia, and Running Deer, Ramona calls him Running Deer, although to the outside world he is Joey, and Violet danced to hip hop in the living room of her apartment. And when the downstairs neighbor complains, Ike says in his irresistible honey voice, hey man, come up and meet my family. And the neighbor will come up wondering why the hell he let himself be dragged up like this. And the kids will start to dance around him, their arms in hip hop motion, their legs like an assembly line, their bodies making quick jive spins as if they were turning on a dime and the neighbor will be unable to help himself and will dance with him with them she will think she has found her future she will bring her man into her bed and into herself and in class on monday night they will both blush relieved to know no one can see it she has found her future at least for now she marries him at the courthouse a justice of the peace presiding athalia joey and violet all standing next to them Athalia's mother comes to the apartment to pick up her daughter and says to Ike in front of Ramona Maria, I hope you make this work. She's too nice for you to treat her the way you treated me. Running Deer and Violet have frosting smeared all over their faces, and Violet is wearing the plastic butterfly from the cake in her hair. When does it go wrong? She will never know for sure. They are so busy. The twins to be look af looked after and ferried around. Her job, his job, he is working in sales at a chain computer store. Night classes, cooking, cleaning. Pay attention, her mother says in an email. But everything else needs attention, too. Ike's daughter falls in with a bad crowd, tries ecstasy and coke, and starts mainlining Oxycontin, runs away from her mother and asks Ramona if she can live with them, but then she doesn't come home to Ike and Ramona either. Ike has trouble in his classes, starts to fail, makes wisecracks about his, how his wife is smarter than he is, but not so smart that she didn't have the sense not to marry him. She tries to be patient, but slips up and shouts, you're right, I don't know what I was thinking. And the twins start to cry, which they somehow manage to do with their whole bodies. And Ike yanks his leather jacket off the back of the couch and slaps his hand over the pack of cigarettes on the dinette table and slams the door on the way out. Ramona swallows a handful of aspirin and wishes she had a teepee she could move into a place where she could lie down and look up at the moon and stars. For a time <clears throat> after her second divorce, she will refuse to go out with men. I'm busy, she will tell them. My children and my classes take up all my time. She gets her children to read to her while she's cooking dinner. She takes them to the park on Sundays. On some days, she can get her studying done while she's at work. At last, at 44, she will receive her Bachelor of Science. The twins, now 15 years old, are in the auditorium when her name is called and she walks across the stage to shake hands and be handed her diploma. They cheer her from their seats. Way to go, Mom, they cry. And strangers, moved by the kids' pride and enthusiasm, take up the shout and now the whole room is yelling, congratulations, way to go, Mom. She will examine her face in the mirror. 
see the fine lines branching beside her eyes, the almost imperceptible sag of her jaw, the slight lengthening of her nose, and think the day may have come when she should have the earring removed from her eyebrow. She's too old, and it is, how can this be, but it is, old-fashioned, body-piercing belongs to the past. But she remembers how Running Deer would tug on it when he was an infant, drawn by the bright silver, the shiny coolness. She remembers his tiny fist, his fat little fingers patting her face, the way he cooed and babbled and that she had to keep blinking for fear he'd poke her in the eye, and she leaves the earring alone, even though Running Deer has long since announced that he will answer only to Joey. When the twins are ready to go off to college, Ramona will breathe more easily. Her face will relax. The netted eyes will soften. She will let herself gain a few pounds, and the result will be a calmer, less severe Ramona. And middle-aged men will look at her and wish their wives were as easygoing, as willing to let their bottoms sway and the tops of their breasts show over the circle necks of their t-shirts. They will wish their wives had not hacked off their hair, saying that only young women can wear long hair. They will wish their wives wore earrings in their eyebrows. Ramona will meet one of these men three years later in the software company she joined as a manager of business services. He will see her one day when he passes the open door to her office and he will walk into the office and introduce himself to her. He's about 5'10", gray at the temples, the hairline receding. He wears a wedding band and a class ring, and his face is pockmarked. He is rich, too rich, she assumes, to take her seriously. She will sleep with him without expectations and be surprised when, some months later, he tells her he loves her. He wants to leave his wife for her. Oh, no, she says, that would be awful. Not for me, he says, awful for you. Awful for your wife. She'll adapt, he says. And she doesn't doubt it. Hasn't she herself adapted plenty? But it's never been easy. It's hard, she'll say. It's hard to change your way of life. It's for the best, he answers, and adds that they will honeymoon on a yacht in the Keys. Indeed, they will be married on the yacht. The setting sun will turn the blue water purple. Dolphins will leap out of the water and dive in again. Pelicans will fly in battery lines, their wings turning the water beneath black. The next day, docked in a cove at breakfast, Ramona and Gerhardt will drink fresh orange juice and nibble on croissants, and Ramona will already know that she has made a mistake. She has married three times, and probably she was never meant to be married even once. She tilts the brim of her sun hat farther over her face. The water is splashing gently against the hull. Gerhardt had gotten, has gotten up and is behind her, bending over her. He kisses the back of her neck. She bursts into tears. He kneels beside her, asks her what's wrong. She can't tell him she has just realized that he bores her to death. <laughs> he bores her to tears. She can't tell him she hates that he left his wife for her that she hates herself for it and she hates him for it. She especially can't tell him that somehow, annoyingly, bafflingly, incredibly, she hates his now former wife for causing all this trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, she will say. She will have to do better than that. She will say that she misses her kids, even that she has trouble understanding how it is that they are now at the university in Tallahassee. She tells him about the day when she was 17 and her mother called to tell her that her father was dead. She tells him that the bus home took her through Panacea and Sopchoppy. She will tell him that Creature from the Black Lagoon was filmed in Wakula County, but he won't have seen it. After this conversation, she will begin to like Gerhardt better. She will decide that she is fortunate to have found a man as sympathetic and caring as he is. Ramona no longer has to work, but she keeps working because she enjoys it. They have a housekeeper, and Ramona enjoys that too, enjoys how they live a very good life, 
with cars that are not a struggle to get in and out of, with weekend dinners at the country club where she can look in Gerhardt's direction and pretend to be listening but be seeing through the huge, fanatically clean window behind him, the rose bushes, the bougainvillea, and what must be the greenest golf course in America, and doing all of this in nice clothes. When Athalia turns up on the doorstep of their white brick colonial house, her nose running and her arms covered in tracks, Ramona will be confused. She will want to remind Athalia that she is not her mother, that she, Ramona, Ramona Maria, Prairie Moonlight, Iglesias Parks Freeman Schmidt, <laughs> is no longer married to her father. That, in fact, Athalia is no kin to her at all. But looking at her, the messy hair, the chewed, peeling lips, she will take the child from Athalia's arms and fold him into her own while telling Athalia to come inside and put her suitcase down. Thank you, Athalia says meekly, and when she does, Ramona sees that she has needle marks between her fingers, too. Who is this, Gerhardt says, back from nine holes on a Sunday afternoon. This is Athalia, Ramona says. Athalia, this is my husband, Gerhard Schmidt. Is it all right if we stay here? Because I don't know where else we can go. Before Ramona can ask about Ike or Athalia's mother, Athalia says, I'll do whatever you want. I'll get clean. I'll get a job. Please, just help us. Because Athalia says us instead of me, Ramona takes Cole into the kitchen with her and tells Aberdeen that there will be two more people living in the house from now on. She will explain to Gerhardt after they get into bed for the night, after Athalia and her son are asleep and Gerhardt has done his half hour on the bicycle in front of the late news and while she is moisturizing her hands with an almond-smelling cream. I don't want you to do this, Gerhardt will say, once again surprising her. She had thought he would go along with anything she wanted. We shouldn't have to do this at this point in our lives. She can stay here until she's back on her feet, but then it's out they go. I'm sorry you feel that way. Ramona does not think that Athalia will get back on her feet, though naturally she hopes she will. What are you saying? Ramona, you work. You have volunteer activities. You have a son and a daughter in college. Don't tell me you want to start all over. No, she says, I don't want to. She will have noticed that he has neglected to mention his own three children, all adults, one in Brownsville, one in New York, and one in Chicago. Then that settles it. I guess so, she sa will say. I guess it does. But what exactly has been settled, she'll ask herself. She has said that to appease him, but nothing has been settled yet. She thinks that what Gerhardt wants is not to be bothered. The world will have changed quite a bit since she was 17, and in ways she never could have forecast, but a child in need will still be a child in need. She will tell her mother about Athalia and Cole and that Gerhardt doesn't want to be bothered. Then don't bother him, but you can't send the child away. He needs a mother. Her mother is living in a small condo with a beaded curtain dividing the kitchen area from the dining area and plants in pots on a small balcony. Ramona will find Ike's current email address and let him know that Athalia is with her. She will insist that Ike forward the information to Athalia's mother. But neither Ike nor Athalia's mother has ever known what to do about Athalia, and they are willing to let Ramona handle the situation. It is not a situation, she thinks. It is a life. But if she said this, they would only feel chastised, and they already hate themselves, so she says nothing. She doesn't think it helps anybody much for people to hate themselves, and so many people do. She and Aberdeen look after Cole while Athalia is in detox and then a halfway house, but then Athalia starts using again and disappears. Ramona Maria looks everywhere. She goes to the missing persons bureau. She hires a detective. Now Ike and Athalia's mother can blame her for their daughter's disappearance, but they still don't want to claim Cole. Joey and Violet bring presents for Cole whenever they come home for Christmas, Thanksgiving, sometimes for their mother's birthday. Violet uses an Afro comb on his hair and pulls too hard, and Joey chases the tears away by singing to him. For some reason, he sings Oklahoma. 
Somewhere along the way, Gerhardt grows used to the idea of coal. He begins to treat coal like a son, taking him to the zoo to see the alligators, telling him bedtime stories. Ramona never reminds Gerhardt of what he said when Cole first came to the house. Cole goes to school and crows up. Ramona moves her mother into assisted living, then into a nursing home. She will visit as often as she can and hold her mother's hand. Her mother is wearing the comfortable Ojibwe moccasins Ramona ordered online and gave to her. In her 90s, her mother has fallen silent, like snow drifting between hemlock and spruce. They will sit together peacefully for a half hour. She will brush her mother's hair. She will clip the spiky hairs that grow from her, chins and that her, from her chin and that her mother can no longer see. She will straighten her mother's room. She will water the cyclamen in the flower pot on the windowsill. Cole is a grown man, a graduate student in geology at the University of Washington in Seattle when Ramona learns that her mother has died. It is not unexpected, but neither is it expected. There had been no indication that her mother was failing physically. She had been at the home for so long that the nurses feel they have lost a friend. The nursing home will offer to help Ramona make arrangements. Ramona will, will drive to Tampa the next day. In the side view mirror, she will see herself as an old lady, almost 70. Her hair gone completely gray, her eyes sunk deeper into the sockets, although the dark spark of them is still there. She is wearing a white blouse open at the throat and sees that her neck has gotten crepey, the skin tissue loose. A pair of reading glasses dangles from a chain around her neck. Her hands on the steering wheel have liver spots. With her bisque skin, the spots don't yell, look at me, but they are there. She thinks she looks pretty good for an old lady, but, she reminds herself, that doesn't change the fact that she is an old lady. She pulls off the highway and into a rest stop and goes into the ladies, where she removes the earring from her eyebrow, starts to put it in her purse, and then drops it into the trash container. At the nursing home, she talks with the resident doctor and the building manager, and then she visits the funeral director, who has an agreement with the home in the bank where her mother kept her last will and testament in a safe deposit box. The funeral, which will be small but respectful, is scheduled for Monday to give her mother's friends time to make plans to attend. Ramona carries empty cartons provided by the home to her mother's room and starts sorting items for the Salvation Army, Joey and Violet and Cole, and to throw away. Her mother distributed most of her belongings before she moved in. Going through her mother's things, Ramona will eventually come across the journal she kept in her first semester of college. Her father had given her the notebook as he and her mother were leaving her on campus for the first time. He had cleared his throat, that fastidious, elegant man, and brought it out from behind his back. You'll have so many things to talk about, he said, and you won't want to talk about them with us, so this is for you. She will not have realized that it had wound up with her mother. She will turn to the first page and on the inside cover see her own name, her given name, in pink ink. Was she really that young once, young enough to keep a diary in pink ink? Startled, she will lift the reading glasses and prop them on her nose, the chain drooping from the tailpiece over each ear. She will marvel at her name as it pitches forward across the page, or curls up like yoga in rounded letters or marches with the excellent posture of toy soldiers, or falls backward like someone not ready to be where her feet already are. She will close her eyes for a moment, remembering how she had been trying to decide which signature would best suit the woman she would become. But today, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, she is 17, and the phone at her elbow is ringing. Thank you very much.